And what I want to do is just go over some concepts and then we're going to apply it. I've got four, four cases. Um, they're a little bit different than the ones I've shown before, but some are the same. And uh, we're going to just use those to look at concepts and, and, and you know, learn. Mainly we're going to learn about reentry and how that, that works and how that causes SVT. So, and my slides aren't, there we go. Okay. So this is an old diagram um, from an anatomy book from when I was in medical school. And this shows very nicely the, the most important part of the heart is actually the right atrium and right ventricle, not the left side of the heart where you guys, you know, spend more time, unfortunately. But the entire electrical system is enclosed in the right side of the heart. So the SA node is actually an epicardial structure by the right atrium. The AV node is at the uh, at the um, uh, AV junction in the right right atrium and the, the bundle of Hiss, which is which is quite important. But this is the this is the main conduction system. Uh, quick question: Can you guys see my cursor moving? Yes, you can. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Sorry, going to next. Okay, and this is the the basic conduction, uh, uh, really rough animation to show you the sequence of events. I show you this not to not to be too basic, but to remind us that there are electrical events at any one site in the heart that are um, that happen in a in time and in sequence. So when you sample. And that's what we're doing in the EP lab, right? We're putting up catheters in certain positions and we're sampling the electrical signal in time. If you sample, let me bring up my, my pen. If you, if you put a catheter here, oh, sorry. So we're clearly not gonna be able to use this video. If, if you, well, it's not gonna draw on it, but if you put a catheter here where my pen is, what you're gonna see is a signal coming period periodically at a certain time. If you put a catheter here, you're going to see a signal as well, but it's going to be later in time than this signal. If you put a catheter down here, you're going to see a third signal, and that's going to come in sequence. So that's kind of the key in, in, um, uh, in EP is what events are happening in time and where are you sampling? So you need to know where your sampling instrument is. In, 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 in uh, Justice's recording studio, that would be the microphone. In REP lab, that would be the catheter. And I, I, I use the analogy of a microphone because that's really what we're doing. That's something to pick up signals. So in the EP lab, we're picking up electrical signals and we have to know where the catheters are and what you expect to see um, so that you can put together the whole picture of the uh, of the um, induction. So this is a typical fluoroscopy picture of where we might have our catheters. And this is an RA, uh, well, this is an AP view, actually. And the catheters are, the, 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 the labels are really pixelated, but this is uh, HRA. Um, And then we have the hiss is here at the AV junction. And then you have your RV apex is down here. Um, and what you would expect to see would be a signal here, then here, then here, if you're in sinus rhythm. The coronary sinus catheter, um, you would expect to see an atrial signal and a ventricular signal since it bridges A and V. The hiss, you'd also expect to see an atrial signal and a ventricular signal, but also the direct signal at the Hiss. So the Hiss electrogram may look something like this. Oops, sorry. With a sharp spike in the center, and then an atrial signal and a ventricular signal. The HRA signal is just gonna look like that. The AV, the CS signal is gonna look like that. And the V will look like that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So let's go forward. 
I've tried to superimpose that graphic on top of the fluoro now, so you see the heart structures. And you could actually see specifically how that how that CS catheter is lying right in the AV junction, how the RV apex is right at the apex of the RV, and the high right atrium is close to the sinus node. You want to get it, usually we put this up in the right atrial appendage. Uh, but that gives you an idea of where our catheters are located in, uh, you know, anatomically. And so this is the sequence in sinus rhythm, as we saw before. And this is what it looks like when you actually look at those electrograms. And this is what I mean about the signals. So this is coming from there. And then what's next? This signal travels down to here to the low right atrium and would light up here. Then you see conduction over the His bundle, which is that sharp thing there. Then you see conduction down the conduction system to the right ventricular apex, so you should activate. Actually, you see the right ventricular apex usually comes a little earlier, and then you get retrograde activation into the His catheter. But that's how the... Uh, and then, then uh, your CS, as I told you before, looks, shows you an A and a V. So that's kind of the sequence... And, and that's the basic, the basis of interpreting intracardiac electrograms, knowing the position of the catheter, what you expect to see in the signal, and then the reverse, when you have an unknown, you look, you know the position of the catheter, you look at what you see on the electrograms, and then you try to put that back into the anatomy and figure it out. So there's a lot of figuring it out. Is that all clear? Any questions? Crystal. Okay. So I want to start, I want to apply this now. Case one is a lady who had 10 years of palpitations, 45 minutes worth of palpitations, and she's a little lightheaded, so she decided to come into the ER. And you're presented with this EKG. Now, since we're on a nice interactive WebEx, and this is going to be stored for posterity, we like to have some brave fellow uh, interpret this EKG or tell me what it is. Um, uh, just start with the basic stuff, rate, rhythm. Do you see P waves? Do you see QRSs? Are the QRSs narrow or wide? Do you see ST T wave changes? Is the axis normal? What? Who wants to yeah. take this on? Which first year fellow would like to take this on? <laughs> That would be a nun. Do we have any? We have no first year fellows on tonight? tonight I can, this morning? I can I take it. Who's that? I love it. Okay. Am I, Am hearing, I hearing you? Oh, yep, oh, yeah. I can hear you. I, just, I, don't, I don't see who's talking anymore because I'm on my slides. But anyway, go ahead. What do you think? What do you think of the rhythm? <laughs> Sorry. Fast or slow? Uh, it's fast around like 150. Yep, and narrow or wide? It's a narrow complex. Uh, yep. I do not see, I mean, the axis is normal. I do not see yep. P waves here. Right. Uh, so I do not, even in V1, I don't see any like pseudo P waves or anything. Okay. Uh, maybe, no, not really. Neither in yep. V2. So it may, maybe you can make an argument that right there, that these are your pseudo P waves, but they're kind of that you would call this what? Generically, the diagnosis would be what? What are we talking about? SVT, right? Yeah, SVT, like I mean, probably like AVNRT. So AVNRT, and the hallmark of that is is either absent P waves or fuse P waves, and that's why you see this pseudo P wave that you mentioned in the, in lead two. Mm -hmm. Now, what would be your what what would you do to stop this? I mean, uh, vagal maneuvers initially. Mm -hmm. Adenosine. Yep. Okay. And this is the baseline EKG, and you no longer see that little notch here. Mm -hmm. So I agree that was probably a pseudo P wave, um, 
or not a pseudo P wave, I mean a retrograde P wave that's buried in the QRS. Mechanism of this tachycardia. Anybody anybody understand where this comes from? Re-entry. Re re-entry in the AV node. Mm -hmm. And what what what's required for re-entry? There's a couple of things. What do we mean by re-entry? So this is like a fast and a slow pathway. So if there is a PAC that comes in and it kind of like circles back and when it circles back, the other, like the fast or slow, one of the pathway is no longer refractory. So it makes a re-entry pathway. So, so what you need for re-entry would be two pathways. Mm -hmm. You need them to have disparate conduction mm -hmm. um, characteristics and disparate refractory characteristics. So basically one arm conducts rapidly, but recovers slowly. That's the fast pathway. And then one arm conducts slowly, but recovers quickly. That's the slow pathway in AVNRT. And I'll show you that on a video. But why is that important for reentry? Because um, you need uh, a conduction to always encounter excitable tissue. So if you're if if the uh, um, uh, tissue recovers quickly, it's excitable. It can continue. It can perpetuate an arrhythmia. So let's look at this on the little animations here. So that's one pathway around the AV node, and then you have another pathway around the AV node. And you actually have, this is why you have P waves buried in the QRS, because you're activating the A and the V almost simultaneously. In fact, the, the V to A, um, the distance between the V and the A, the V to A interval in this case, is going to reflect ret the amount of time it takes to retrogradely conduct up whatever pathway you're going up, the fast pathway usually. So that's going to be quite narrow, and typically it's less than 70 milliseconds. So that's a hallmark of AVNRT. If your V to A interval is that narrow, it's usually not a pathway, because what if it were an accessory pathway out here? Well, the V to A interval, the amount of time it takes to get from a V to the atrium, reflects conduction down here, across the ventricle and up the pathway and back to your catheter, which might be there. So that's typically over 100 milliseconds. So if you see that kind of thing, you suspect a, an accessory pathway or AVRT. If you see a short V to A, you suspect AVNRT. And this is, this is what this looks like. Let's go to the next. So here's the high right atrium. And there's your, that correlates with your pseudo P wave. And here's your RV apex. Uh, I don't have an RV apex. This is your ventricular signal from your, on your CS. And they're almost simultaneous. And here's your hiss bundle. So you should have a hiss activation on the way down to the ventricle because you're coming from the AV node and that's and then down the hiss. So A and V are very, very close together. Here's the video I wanted to show you and this kind of visually explains to you what the, you know, why you have to have those changes in the, in the, um, in conduction. I wonder if I've played that. Whoops, hold on. Yeah, it should be playing. <clears throat> Except now we got to wait for, for it to start. So in AV, AVNRT, what you're going to see when this eventually decides to play, I should have should have cut this shorter. Uh, you have a fast pathway which has fast conduction and a slow pathway which has slow conduction. And normally, they collide and extinguish over here. The other thing that you see is this, the fast pathway has a long refractory period. The slow pathway has a short refractory period. So uh, as the waveform comes down, you can see that it's leaving a trail of excitable tissue. 
So now you can imagine that if you throw in an APC, you might be able to, to get down that slow pathway. Look at that. Now, what happens? This is free to go because the rest of the tissue behind it is always, it always can encounter excitable tissue. So that's the mechanism of every reentrant circuit. And that specifically shows you the, the mechanism for AV node reentry. Okay, and, and again, we're going retrograde up the fast pathway, which is why your V to A interval is, is so short. Anatomically, the, the, the uh, uh, his bundle sits up here. This is an LAO. This is, this is not very, diff very easy to see because I didn't put any heart in it. Um, this is your coronary sinus. This would be your, your mitral valve here. I, I should draw on it, actually. So your, your mitral valve is here. Your tricuspid valve is here. This is LAO. In this case, your tricuspid valve is here. Your RV is here. Your RA is here. So the point of ablation, the hiss is here. The slow pathway is here. Again, the hiss is up here. The slow pathway is down here. Somewhere between the coronary sinus ostium and the tricuspid valve. So we ablate there and we terminate, uh, not terminate, but we, we, we get rid of that slow pathway and that's the treatment. Any questions about that, about the anatomy or the mechanism of reentry? Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I have to warn you in this mode, by the way, when, when I'm looking at, I'm just looking at the slides, I don't see the texts coming up. So if there's a, if somebody puts up a text question, can, can you know, if, uh, uh, just, just let me know verbally. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, Yes. Um, just a quick question. Yes. Um, why do you see um, the signal at the RVX first before the HIS bundle? Oh, at the RVA before the HIS bundle. Because, let's, let me, um, come to this. The reason you see the RV typically before the His bundle, so this is the the V signal from the His bundle. This is the RV. The way we've uh, we've drawn it, you don't really see that much of a difference because this is really just a, a an illustration. But you have fast conduction down the right and left bundles. The His catheter lies right here. Okay. So the His catheter is here, right? The RV catheter is here. You have fast conduction down the His Purkinje system. It activates the RV and then it has to go all the way back to get to the His catheter. You see what I'm saying? So there will be a little bit of a delay getting to the distal tip of the His catheter since you kind of bypass it by going down the rapid conduction system. And so the RVA usually gets activated first before the septum or the left ventricle. And clearly you can see here that the LV, as evidenced by this sucker here, is getting activated last. Okay. Or later, I should say. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'll leave this as red because that red looks cool. Now let me get back to, I don't know what slide we were on, case. We did case one. <laughs> Ooh, my animations are slow.
Are they flickering on your? There you go. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I think we're at three now. Now. Stop the lever. The lever. Yes. What's up? Somebody have a question? No, no I think we are at case two. Yep. Yep. I know. I'm trying to get to it. All right. Who wants to interpret this electrogram? This is somebody who's had, again, palpitations. Um, and uh, does somebody want to take this on, or do you want me to just walk you through it? Can you, try. Go ahead. Yeah, so we have, uh, I just want to try to describe what I see in this. So we have the service. Here's and then the service. We have, then we have ablation catheters. Yep. And then we have, I think it's a C, uh, uh, the the one that says lateral. Yeah. Is it like, is it like a atrium or? Yes, uh... this is in the lateral wall of the right atrium. Okay. This then is on. The, yep. A HES and a CS, and yep. I think yep. I'm just guessing because uh, you're studying more in the atrium, you're trying to map something there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see on the surface there is two to one activation. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, so there's your atrial signal on my ablator or on your lateral. So yes, you have two A's for every V. My my his catheter is a little bit deep. It's mostly showing you a V signal. So I don't have a great A. There's probably an atrial signal here and buried in here. Um, but you can absolutely see your two to one. And if you look at the surface, you see P wave. P wave, QRS, P, P, QRS. And also note that we have a uh, paper speed of 100 millimeters per second. So everything looks kind of spread out, but we are in tachycardia here. Yeah, uh, so obviously we're, we're dealing with uh, with some kind of atrial tachyarrhythmia and we can right. use the, the atrial and the CS uh, information to understand the mechanism. Exactly. Um, so the CS catheter, I see the activation is not like all the same time. It's a little bit moving, I think, uh, uh, probably right to left uh, or. Yep. If from the proximal coronary sinus, which is yeah. at the CS os closest to the right atrium. And then mm -hmm. it's going out to the distal. Yep. Yeah. And then. Um... Then I'm thinking now along the, the like atrial flutter, uh, yeah, most likely because it's so, uh, it's it's going down the lateral wall, so it's going from the top down, mm -hmm. and then this is if we buy this as an A. Well, I don't know where I can't really see the A, so I'm not sure where the septal where the septal A is, but it's going down and then it's hitting this. And then what is it doing? It's either coming back up the septum, which I don't have data here for you. If if this is a if 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 I'm if I call this an A and a V, and this is just a um, I, I've somehow just I'm missing missing all my A's. Uh, then then it comes up the septum. Then it goes back over the top here. So there's almost continuous activation through the entire s cycle, right? This stuff here on the left atrium, we have to figure out, is that passive or is that part of the circuit? That we don't know. But if it's right atrial flutter, what we know is that, that that's, a, that's a rhythm that encircles the tricuspid valve. So you would expect it to see it if it's going counterclockwise flutter. You'd expect it to see it going down the lateral wall, then going to the coronary sinus, and then somehow going to the, to the uh, septum, which I don't, don't have here. Um, now, this is where my catheters are, and this is graphically what I was telling you. It's going top to bottom, CS, then HIS. And this is a really good example of if you know where your catheters are in space and you know what the rhythm is or you see the electrograms, then you can, uh, you can figure it out. Now, what I didn't put here on a red dot was that you're also activating across here, but that's passive. That's not part of the rhythm, and we need to prove that, which we will in a minute. 
Okay, so that's that's what it looks like on the egram. That's what I explained. And this is putting it all together in two pictures. Does that make any sense? I have a question, yes. Dr. Delorto. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. And um, could you go back to the previous slide where it's the intro? Yes, in this one. So uh, where, which part is the his activation on the his electrogram? I, I don't have a hiss on it's it's a it's a crappy hiss and I don't have the hiss activation on here. It's okay. it's, it's probably, probably it's somewhere in there, but you can't see the hiss hiss on this. Okay. You know. Okay. So I think I might have a better flutter egram, which I'm gonna replace this. This is an old egram, but I've I'm gonna replace it that has more clear septal activation, but this is not the best example. I just noticed that. Um but this is what it looks like now. If we take, we have a tool where we can take this this kind of analysis and data and have the computer display it in a kind of a color coded fashion. And what we have is an RAO view of the right atrium. So this is SVC, IVC, tricuspid valve. In the LAO, you have the coronary sinus coming off the posterior. What I've done is actually an LAO caudal view. So this is the IVC. This is the SVC. This is the tricuspid valve. And the way you read this rainbow is it tells you relative activation to a to an arbitrary timing signal. So the earliest site is white, then it should go red, yellow, green, blue, purple. So if we follow that around, white, red, yellow, uh, you know, orange, yellow, there's a green, blue, and purple is over here. And per here you can see the purple is right up against here. You have these squashed colors which tell you there's some slow conduction. But this is the, this is the, the counterclockwise flutter around the tricuspid valve. And you can actually display that as a movie. And this is by done by taking samples all over here and, and the computer displays it in a GPS type, you know, with, with a G, GPS type um, um, algorithm. And what are these brown spots here? Burns. Yeah, so if I want to stop this rhythm, the best way to do it would be to, to cut the circuit and an easy place to cut the circuit would be between the tricuspid valve annulus and the IVC. Now what happens when I do that is we terminate the arrhythmia. Again, you see a really crappy hiss. This is not a this is just stuck up in the septum somewhere. And and we realize that this is not an atrial signal on there. The atrial signal, here's the atrial signal here maybe here, okay, and we know that because in sinus we can see it, see what it really looks like. So on this egram, you go down the lateral wall to the CS, to the septum, to the top of the atrium, down the lateral wall to the CS, back to the septum, down the lateral wall, CS, septum, and then we finally, down the lateral wall, and then we block. We never make it to the CS. Why? Because I now finished my burn, so this is coming around and now hits my ablation line. Uh, what are I? Oh, and, and, and this is how we can prove that. After a blading flutter, if we pace in the coronary sinus, you expect when you're pacing the heart, this, the, the activation should come out and go in both directions, right? So if I wasn't blocked between the coronary sinus and the low right atrium, this signal should actually be early. But instead, I've got, again, it's going over the top when I'm pacing from the CS. I'll show you this in a graphic. But what we look for is a long time between the pace signal and the distal 
low right atrium. And that also shows me that I've created a line of block. This is what I'm talking about. The catheter is actually along this wall here. I can draw it in. So the lateral catheter is actually running this way. The CS catheter is here. That's my pacing site. And my His catheter is here. So if I'm pacing here, this is this is the way flutter goes, right? Either either direction. If I'm pacing here in the coronary sinus, my if I've blocked, then my signals can't get past here, and it, it has to go around the top. So this is this is what it looks like graphically. I'm pacing in the coronary sinus. The electricity comes out both sides, but it's blocked here, so it can't keep going. So now it goes up over the hiss, prox, distal, and we can see that graphically again here. If I pace here, it's coming around here and actually stopping here and getting blocked. I didn't take a lot of signals, so you can't really see the whole circuit. But that's what it should look like once we've blocked along the 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 TV IVC isthmus. Does that make sense? It does, the, uh, Dr. Delorfano. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so, how sophisticated do you want to be when you're like studying and mapping these tachycardias prior to ablation? Because <clears throat> I noted you're you're also having a a, a lateral uh, atrium catheter. Mm -hmm. So I assume you're trying to differentiate between the atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter. Yep. Like usually, I would assume that flutter is easy to diagnose by the surface EKG. Yes. And what do you see on the surface EKG? You see the sawtooth. And what that represents is that there's something going on in diastole continuously. Right? from A to A. That's why there's a sawtooth uh, pattern. In atrial tachycardia, you'll see discrete P waves with, with silence between the P waves. We see the same thing, and I don't have an example of an atrial tachycardia to show you um, because I, I didn't want to get into that. that um, that's a little more complex. But instead of seeing activation on all of the catheters throughout the cycle, throughout the tachycardia, you actually see discrete activation. And instead of on the, uh, on the, 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 the three-dimensional map, instead of seeing all of the signal going around, what you're going to see is more of a bullseye or target, and you're going to see one hot spot, and then you're going to see activation emanating from it, which I can show you at some point in time. Um, I'm, I'm sure I could pull one up, but but that's that would be the difference. Instead of here, I can actually draw it on here. So instead of having a um, activation map, which goes, whoops, sorry, continuously around in different colors, right? With, with, you know, slow conduction here. So you'll see this is what we basically saw on that flutter map, right? We saw that, that, that rainbow that was continuous. In atrial tachycardia, you're going to see the white spot, and then you're going to see the colors emanating out like this, and it's going to, so the color pattern is going to go like this. It's not going to fold back on itself. So you'll have white, red, orange, yellow, blue, purple that way instead of white, red, orange, yellow, blue, purple. So in this case, if I put a catheter here, 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 whoops, sorry for the line, I'm going to see activation, you know, in various times at all three sites. In this case, 
if I put a catheter here, here, and here, I'm going to see simultaneous activation at all three sites. So here I might see activation there, activation there, activation there, right? These would be the my egrams in, in, in a flutter. Here I'm going to see that. So that's what atrial tachycardia would look like versus a flutter or a reentrant rhythm. Does that make sense? It does. This gets back to what I said before. You have to know where your catheters are, so where are you sampling from, and then you don't know what you're look, dealing with. So now you look at the egrams from those, those catheters, these three catheters are in the same spot, let's say, in the heart. Let's say, let's say there's one in the his. Let's say we got a catheter in the in the uh, on the lateral wall and a catheter in the CS. Same thing here, right? But to see this pattern tells you one thing. It tells you that you've got to have stepwise activation. To see this pattern tells you that you've got to have simultaneous activation, so it really tells you the mechanism of tachycardia. That's how we figure these things out in the, in the, in the lab. And having that three-dimensional mapping capability really helps a lot because it shows that graphically and you can understand it. It makes it much easier. Yes? Is good? All right. Yes. Next. So let's look at... I'm going to show you two examples, and we're going to, again, apply these, these concepts, and these are both going to be reentrant again. So I, did, I, I stuck with reentry in this talk, and I didn't, that's why we didn't put any atrial tact, because that's an automatic rhythm. But those are the two mechanisms of SVTs, an automatic rhythm or a reentrant rhythm. As, um, AVRT, AVNRT, flutter, those would be reentrant. Atrial tachycardia would be would be uh, automatic. Atrial fibrillation is thought to be reentrant with micro re multiple micro reentry circuits, uh, but it's uh, triggered by probably an automatic tachycardia, which is why we we isolate pulmonary veins in AFib. So here's a case of another person with the bowel. I can make all the cases the same. X, you know, uh, male or female patient of whatever age with palpitations. Um, and, and structurally normal heart. So this was the EKG for this patient. And this is a first year fellow EKG that, so a first or second year fellow needs to interpret this EKG. And this is a board question. So somebody jump in and, and make this diagnosis. How come you're showing VTAC when it, this is an SVT talk? Well. <laughs> Hello. It uh, looks like a white complex tachycardia. Yep. Um, appears to have periods of irregularity. Yep. Um, so, um, um, so in someone like this, I'll be concerned for um, accessory pathway with um, atrial fibrillation. Mm-hmm. So we call this pre-excited AFib. And the reason why this is important to you guys is this is probably one of the only EP questions on the cardiology boards, but this is there every year. Um, pre-excited atrial fibrillation. And it's dangerous because if you look um, here, for example, you have a um, pretty close R to R. I don't think we get any tighter, maybe here. But you can actually get up to you know, 200 millisecond R to R intervals with, with patients who have really good um, conduction down their accessory pathway, and they'll fibrillate from that. <coughs> so this is a situation where you have um, a risk of sudden cardiac arrest in, in uh, WPW. Now, if you see this in the ER, what's the, what's the correct maneuver? How do you, what do you do? There's, there's two, two correct answers for this. Okay. 
Yeah, procainamide or shock, that's correct. The blood pressure is 104 over 65, so on the boards, procainamide would be the correct answer. Diltiazem is the incorrect answer. And when you have somebody, when you're presented with a wide complex tachycardia and you give diltiazem, and we'll explain this a little more de in detail, but a wide complex tachycardia, if you give diltiazem, we call that the diltiazem death challenge. And the way that goes is you administer a bolus of diltiazem and if the patient dies, then it was VTAC. If the patient survives, it was SVT. So that's that's something that we joke about, but you'll see that rather routinely uh, performed in the emergency department. Um, and uh, so don't don't do that. A denison would not be a bad idea because it's so short acting, but it still can can fibrillate the patient if you just have complete uh, uh, conduction down the AP. It, it would not terminate the rhythm. So procainamide will terminate the rhythm by addressing the AFib and by addressing the conduction down the accessory pathway. So that's that's the board answer. And that's his EKG. So um, any guesses where the accessory pathway might be? Left side. Why do you say left side? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm right because the P wave in lead one is upright. Um, P wave? You you yeah. must mean the delta wave is upright. That's that's the, yeah, that's say, right. yeah. Now that here's here's for the for the um, uh, first year fellows or for anybody. Here's how I think about it. If you have a right bundle morphology. Right bundle branch block means that you're conducting down the left bundle, okay? So whenever you see a right bundle morphology, it puts the origin of the tachycardia in the left ventricle. Conversely, if you have left bundle branch block, what, what happens? That means you're activating the right side first. So that, that you know, QS and V1, left bundle branch morphology, puts your tachycardia in the right ventricle. So that applies for VTAC and for accessory pathways. So so the whoops sorry. The the um, upright delta wave in lead V1 and lead V2 looks like a right bundle branch block and means that it's inserting into the left ventricle. Now you look at some of the other things, it's upright in leads two, three, and ABF, which means it's heading towards the inferior wall. So it might be along the anterior or even the lateral mitral annulus. And finally, it's probably initially downward in one and definitely downward in AVL, which are your lateral leads which means it's going away from the lateral wall. So that's a really quick and easy way to try to get a ballpark location for this, which would put this somewhere on the lateral, uh, interlateral or lateral mitral valve annulus. And in fact, if we look at this and we're pacing the atrium, what we see is that we see actually the earliest ventricular, the earliest, well, I take it back. We're not actually pre-excited. Let me, let me, let me show you a, a uh, uh, this, this is, this is uh, not, not pre-excited. Let me show you the next one. Okay. This is, this is actually um, how we might initiate. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, this is how we might initiate tachycardia. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is pacing. We go A, his, V. You see that the QRS is narrow. We don't see a delta wave here. So we're going solely down the AV node. And the his to V is, is pretty normal. There might be some little bit of conduction down the accessory pathway because we do see some activation of the ventricle on the left side early. But when I put in an APC here, do you guys see that pattern? This is 100 
this is 100 beats a minute, then when I put in an APC, it goes down the hiss, down the AV node, hits the ventricle, but what's this? This is another atrial signal. So somehow, I got back up to the atrium, so I paced the atrium, I went to the V, and I caused, and I got another signal up into the atrium again. How did I do that? It, Anybody? It went back up. The... It went back up. It re-entered the atrium. And where did it re-enter? Anybody figure that out? Oh, we'll, we'll look at the earliest one. Yep. Uh, it would be probably the, I don't see it quite well. It says MCS. Yep, that's mid mid coronary sinus, distal coronary sinus, proximal coronary sinus. Yeah, so that would be somewhere probably around the left side. Yeah, so, but look where my, can you see my arrow? My cursor? Yes. So this black line here is, is the earliest atrial signal that's yeah. through the ventricle. And you see that looks different than these these other signals. Yeah, so this oh, is lateral left would be. The, yes, and that's on the lateral mitral valve, which is, well, I'll show you in one second. Let's look at, this is tachycardia now. I initiate tachycardia by going A, his V. Then we go back up. Whoops, sorry. Then we go back up. Okay. Here's the A, then we go down the AV node, down the hiss to the V. Then we go back up the to the atrium. So you see how this is a self-perpetuating circuit? We go down the AV node here, and we go up the accessory pathway out on the left side, stimulate the atrium again, which goes down the AV node and back up. So you have... Not only is this is this uh, a self-perpetuating reentry, but you also see activation through all parts of the cardiac cycle. So, including the ventricle, by the way, because in this circuit, the ventricle is part of it. So there's something going on the whole time. Let's look here. Um, I have a question. Yes. So on the CS catheters, you saying if the initial deflection um, uh, for the you know the retrograde a was say in the proximal cs mm -hmm. that would be mean that it is near the septum or near wherever that is because what i've done here is i've actually pulled the catheter back a little bit or, or i'm sorry i advanced the catheter so that uh you know to kind of bracket this but in this in this strip which is the same patient the earliest atrial activation is between the a, the proximal and the mid, but you wouldn't know where that is unless you looked at it on the mapping system or on fluoro. So, but the the major point is this: if you're going up from the ventricle to the atrium in a normal patient, you should go up this one first. You should be going up the septum earliest, up the hispergingy system. In this case, you're going up something even earlier than the his a so that's the lateral you know that's and that's on the lateral side of the heart so you're going back up an accessory pathway and then you know getting to the to the uh, septum late so this is something we would call eccentric retrograde activation if this were later here say and the septum was first we would call that concentric retrograde activation and let me show you something cool and we'll get back to that and this will hammer home the re-entry um, uh, talk that we're saying what happens here <clears throat> why do we go from wide to narrow but notice something when we go from wide to narrow first of all trust me i'll show you the timing but you can visually see the tachycardia is slower, and then it speeds up of aberrancy happening at a slower heart rate versus a faster heart rate. Usually when the heart rate speeds up, you get aberrant, but in this case, 
you go from wide to narrow and you speed up the tachycardia. And the V to A ratio uh, interval is longer when you have a wide tachycardia, wide QRS, versus here where you can absolutely see the V to A interval is shorter. This is a hallmark of WPW, or, or I should say AVRT. When you go from left bundle to narrow complex and your tachycardia speeds up and your V to A interval slows, uh, gets shorter. And I will explain that, and that will make, this will, this will show you for sure how this reentry is working. But uh, is this the, what we call Comel's sign? Uh, I don't know it as, I don't know the name, I don't know that name. Uh, probably, you know. <laughs> I yeah, I thought, I think I, uh, I think it is, Dr. Delorfano. It's, is that uh, the name of it, Comel sign? Yeah, C O, I think Q M E L, something like that. Okay. Um, so when you see uh, it, it gets slower uh, mm. with the bundle, that means that the, um, the, the ventricles are involved in the tachycardia mechanism. And it yep. sort of proves it, that it's an accessory pathway. Yes, and I'll show you why. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know that, that term. So look at this. Here's my little diagram again. And let's look at the tachycardia. Follow the dots. You go from the A to the Hiss, down to the V. The next A is there. And then back to the hiss. So you have that circuit. And now we're going left bundle to narrow. So let's look at the conduction system. What happens during left bundle branch block? Conducts down the right bundle first. Correct. And then how does it get over here? It has to go through the septum, which takes a long time. Then it goes up and around. So that through the septum time is reflected in the long V to A time here. What happens when the left bundle branch magically goes away? You actually now can conduct down both bundles. You have a narrow QRS because you no longer have left bundle branch block and you don't have to go through the septum to get back up there. And the circuit the, the circuit is actually shorter, which means the cycle length of the tachycardia is faster. So rather than having to go all the way around here, which causes a slower tachycardia, you have a faster cycle and uh, therefore a faster tachycardia and a shorter V to A time. Now this 100% proves that you have SVT or AVRT utilizing a left-sided pathway. And it's the left bundle branch block with resolution of that shows you that you have it on the ipsilateral side. You have a left-sided pathway. If it were the opposite, you had right bundle and it got faster when the right bundle um, um, went away, then it would be a right-sided pathway. Same, same concept, though. Um, is, is there a menu that you guys do in the EP lab to create a left bundle morphology to help demonstrate that? No, that's that's just uh, that's luck. But you know, we see, when we see it, you know what happens. But when you see this on a twelve lead EKG, you've made the diagnosis. When you go from left bundle to narrow and the tachycardia um, speeds up, you know exactly what you're dealing with. So send them to the EP lab. Any questions on that? Yeah, so Dr. Delorfano, I took this from uh, an article in the uh, no from Jack. Mm -hmm. They call it actually the Kumel's law, and it's uh, very awesome. like but for nothing else causes that. Like Correct. you say, when the when the bundle branch block is linked to SVT slowing, it implies that the blocked bundle was part of the SVT circuit, yep. and yep. therefore the arrhythmia mechanism must be an accessory pathway that is ipsilateral to the blocked bundle branch. Yes, that's exactly what I said. Um, you you one hundred percent are sure of the tachycardia, and you can make that diagnosis on a twelve lead EKG. Not you don't need catheters in the heart. So there you go. So 
my my question is probably the same that Justice asked. Uh, so just to confirm, if I heard yeah. it correct or not, left bundle happening and then suddenly disappearing is just a matter of luck. It's got nothing to do with the tachycardia itself, correct? Um, no, it does have. Yeah, this can only happen if you have this tachycardia. But you you happen to see the left bundle branch block during the rhythm resolve. I mean, that's that's luck if you catch it, you know. Um, but it'll only happen with with this tachycardia. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, yeah. But if I mean, I mean, whether the left bundle being present and disappearing, meaning paroxysmal left bundle, yep. is is a separate issue from the tachycardia itself. It's not like related to the tachycardia, correct? Um, yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, but it, but remember the left bundle and and the 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 conduction system is part of the circuit, a necessary part of the circuit, uh, and that's that's why you see that. Somebody's on the pediatric rotation. It sounds like. Got it. I'm sorry. That was me. I'm just holding my son. Too. Uh, I thought sorry. I was one of the first year fellows uh, in agony over this. <laughs> Uh, somebody, somebody filling out paperwork for an interventional fellowship. <laughs> so, all right, I want to show you one more very quickly to just because uh, we have two minutes. This is a baseball player who has that EKG, which is let's tell me where this pathway is. Look at V1. The, so. The, it's yeah, V1 negative. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, probably right sided. Right sided, yeah. And I see it uh, positive in the inferior leads. Yeah. So it's something superior looking down yeah. the inferior. So maybe right free wall, lateral wall. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And then exactly. I see in, in one in AVL, it's probably on the negative side. So it's uh, moving. Uh, I'm not no. sure. It's, that doesn't, it's no, positive. it's it's actually more positive, but it it has positive. to be because if it's right sided, it's got to be headed towards a lateral wall. It can't be coming exactly. Through. Yeah, so that doesn't help you much. But yes, you're correct. It's right sided pathway. This is uh, what we saw when in the baseline EKG, and what you actually see is the earliest activations in the RV apex compared to the left side, which is consistent with a right-sided accessory pathway. And you also see that the hiss, actually the hiss is buried here. So hiss activation happens uh, probably after Q, uh, the, EK, the QRS. And your retrograde conduction is earliest on the, on the right side. And the only thing I have on the right side really is the hiss and the HRA. But they're all all this this looks like concentric conduction, but if we already know he has got a pathway, so we have to put another catheter up in the in the in the right to figure that one out. And this is the SVT. Okay. SVT is narrow, but the earliest A is actually seen in the HRA, not the HIS. And where's my HRA catheter? It's usually off to the lateral side of the right atrium. So this is a very abnormal activation pattern. So we go A, his, V, A, his, V, right? So you have AV reentrant tachycardia, but the earliest retrograde activation of the atrium is in the high right atrium. And the reason for that, here's my catheter. So if the pathway is over here, the tachycardia is going to go down like this and come back up this way. Does that make sense? Okay. And this is just an RAO view here and an LAO view here. This is a 3D map and shows you where, this is the LAO, so this is the tricuspid valve, your mitral valve will be here. And this is where we ablated it successfully, exactly where Mansour said it would be. Okay. 
and then look at the difference. Here's pre-excited and here's normal. And here's your hiss, which is buried here. See that hiss there? And it's buried in the QRS and, and merging with the V in sinus rhythm without, a, without the accessory pathway, you've got a normal hiss to V interval. And retrograde block, I paste the V, I don't have, here's my A, here's my sinus A, I don't have V to A conduction anymore, which is excellent. That's what we want to see. You know, some people don't conduct backwards up their AV node. And then there's his, his, his follow-up EKG is there, it's normal. Um, quick question. Quick question. Yeah.